Coming up on this edition of the Stingray Show right here on Tide 100.9, we are talking all about the Crimson Tide of Alabama with a Prattville, Alabama native who played at the Capstone from 2003 until 2005. He was then drafted in the second round by the New Orleans Saints, Roman Harper. He will join us today on the Stingray Show right here on Tide 100.9. The dogs and Stingray are coming for you! <laughs> this is Stephen Ray, aka Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm Heath Hopkins. I'm here in DeSoto County, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. I don't know if you want me to get mad. I don't know if you want me to get mean. I don't know if you want me to get rowdy. But that's what I'm about to do. First defense. Ever! We are Mississippi State! Fear the Bills! How many chicken wings you eat in a city? And you just it look, ballpark it. Four. What? Four chicken wings, my Here we go, guys. Dobbs, back to pass. Launching the ball! Jared, he's got it! Jared, he's got it! Touchdown, Tennessee! They shot the dogs in Sanford Stadium! Are you kidding me? My God Almighty! What an epic way for the Tennessee-Georgia rivalry to end this game! What a play! Wow! And Heath, any final thoughts before we sign off here on the Tide 100.9? It is great to be on with all the great folks in Tuscaloosa. And hey... If you don't like it, you better learn to love it because this is going to be the best show going today, baby. Welcome inside another exciting edition of the Stingray Show, everybody. I am your host, Stephen Ray, and let's go on ahead and get right to it. Let me go on ahead and pull up my co-host, Heath Hopkins. And Heath, before I pull you up, my friend, can I go on ahead and get a big roll tide from you? Roll tide roll. <laughs> so Heath, how are you doing today, sir? We're doing wonderful. Uh, you know, hey, summertime's here. Uh, I'm a summertime kind of guy. Uh, you can't see me, but I got my flip flops on as uh, we're doing this interview. So yeah, I got my shorts on, my flip flops on. As soon as we're done, I'm going back and having fun. Absolutely. Well, today we are talking all about the Crimson Tide with a big time star there on the capstone. One of his biggest moments was forcing the fumble in 2005 against Tennessee. We will definitely touch on that. Yeah, you know, Roman was a big time playmaker, but I have thoroughly enjoyed Roman joining the SEC network and his insight. I deeply respect. Uh, his point of view and uh, what he says. And uh, Roman has an insight that I think is very unique, and I enjoy everything that he shares with us on the SEC Network. Let me also say this. He is a New Orleans Saints Hall of Famer. He is a two-time pro bowler in 2009 and 2010, and he won a championship ring with the New Orleans Saints, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Roman Harper. Roman, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, man. How you guys doing, Steve? Heath, uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, I love the introduction. And I got to ask, Mr. Heath, uh, what is so good about my insight on the SEC Network? I love to hear everybody else's opinion about <laughs> myself as an analyst. Because I always like to try and improve more. And, you know, I, I want to try and stay hired in this job. I'm new to it. <laughs> so it's always good hearing other outside information or opinions. But, you know, no one comes on the show and asks me a question right off the bat. So let me say thank you, Roman, for, for that. <laughs> but the, the one thing I really enjoy about you, Roman, I've always been a defensive kind of guy. I, I like seeing that. But your breakdown of things, because usually we've got a quarterback up there. Usually we've got, you know, Chris Goings a receiver. You know, he doesn't like to get hit. You know, so I, I like to hear your insight and your intake on things because you see it from a defensive side of things and you know how to shut it down. So whenever you talk about uh, uh, your insight, 
you know, I'm not listening to a wide receiver. I'm not listening to a quarterback. I'm listening to a defensive guy, and I think defense wins the game. It wins championships. I said it. I like it, and I like you, brother. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I I only speak from what I know, so uh, I appreciate that, which is defense. Now, I, I want to share a little bit before the show. Uh, we were speaking very briefly. Uh, uh, you know, yes, this is Roman Harper, but it, Romeo Gonzalez, that, that's kind of your, 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 your uh, what? <laughs> Your, your, your street name? I mean, what, what are we going with on that? It, it is it is one of my aliases. I won't tell all, but uh, it is <laughs> one of my aliases. And you know, whenever I'm on my phone or on a video chat through my phone, uh, that's what that's how my phone is stored or named. So uh, if anybody finds my phone, they don't know it's actually Roman Harper's number. It's Romeo Gonzalez. So it's just one of those things I've had. I got a couple other names too, man, that I picked up through playing video games through all the years. So it's just. One of the one of the few aliases I go by. I've got to ask this: Why Romeo and why Gonzalez? Well, Romeo's close to Roman, and then right. Gonzalez is. Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm a really big fan of Cinco de Mayo, so you, me, and Cinco de Mayo are like locked hand in hand. So I, I think that just has kind of happened. And uh, and no, you don't ever see anybody named Romeo with the last name Gonzalez. So it just really just <laughs> just kind of all went together. I like it. Well, Roman, real quick, we in a here soon we are going to have Dari Noka on the show. Can I love you Dari. give us a fun story that happened maybe offset or onset between you and Dari Noka? So, you know, I I love Dari. Uh, he's been a pleasure and a blessing to work with because he's so good. He's so professional, and he's just so easy to have a conversation with. And the best TV is when you're just up there going back and forth. And we like to joke on and off the camera. But I, it's just funny because if I talk to him about something personal, he's so quick with it to throw it in the show on you and, like, surprise you. <laughs> and all you can do is laugh at yourself or just try to defend yourself. But you're on live TV. That's the thing about it that nobody really understands. That You know, I'm used to having people in my ear and talking through the microphones or the headsets. But when somebody hits you with something quick with it on live TV – you just got to get back and you just got to fire back at him. I think some of the best TV I've been able to do with Dari is um, we would do the Saturday night show. So uh, it's me, Dari, it was uh, Chris Doring and Gene Chizik. Yes. And one day, I guess Gene Chizik like yawned or something. And Chris <laughs> Doring just went in on him, called him like this old sleepy guy. And it's like Chiz really got angry. Like he puffed up a little bit. And if you know Gene, like Chizik, you know, he, he still looks like he lifts weights. He still is in the weight room pretty heavy. So uh, it just is really funny, the the dynamic between all three of us. Uh, Chiz being a very, very defensive-minded guy. I agree with him so so often. We just, we just click on the same things, the same things that drives me mad. He's already talking about it. And he already understands that because he had to coach it. Me, I had to play, and now I'm having to adjust looking at a lot more college. But, you know, Chiz being a coach, he had to deal with a lot of those things. And, Chris Dorn, he just really only cares about his touchdown record being broken by Devontae Smith. So it was just always funny how it's so many inside jokes that go on throughout a whole show that you, nobody even knows. I mean, we'll be on live TV watching this, but we're totally paying attention to another game that's going on right in front of us. And we'll be joking while we're not on camera, while somebody else is talking. And, and then next, you know, Devontae Smith will score a touchdown and we – we just throw it right in Chris CD's face the whole time, every show. It's just been so fun to uh, – and uh, being at the SEC Network, man, it really is like family. They, they've treated me great in my one year that I've been there, and I've really, really enjoyed my time. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you played your high school ball in Prattfield, correct? Yes, I did. And, and you were a quarterback, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in your high school days. That is a true statement. All right. Now, now I'm a Mississippi State grad, and Matt Wyatt, who – Yes, who, he was. Does the games? He was the quarterback there in Prattville. Yes, he was. He transferred in, and yes, he was the quarterback for two years. We actually threw the ball. We had this coach come in, and he opened it up. Matt White was perfect for those couple of years, man. He threw the ball all over the ballpark. He was big. He had a big arm. It was like prototypical quarterback of what you wanted: six four, two hundred some pounds, could throw the ball. And he went over there. He played at Mississippi State. He still does a lot of things over there in that area of Starkville, uh, yeah. covering uh, football. Uh, diagnosing plays, things of that nature. I, I follow him on Twitter, so he's got a pretty active Twitter account. 
Yeah, he's got a radio show, and, and, and Matt and I were in school together at the same time. I was a student nice. uh, during that time when Matt was playing quarterback here at State. You know, uh, but Matt's been on the show before, and he talked about this, and it kind of shocked me. Uh, I said, I said, Matt, you know, if you could go back and do it all over again, what system would you have liked to play in? And he talked about playing with Mike Leach, which made me laugh a little bit because Matt was not known as a throwing quarterback during his time in Starkville, but in his high school days, he he, he talked about his junior year. He threw the ball all over the field. His senior he year, did. They changed it up, but he said there were some talks, you know, with Hal Mummy uh, there at Kentucky uh, uh, back briefly, and he said, but you know. I didn't have a great senior year, and I went to Mississippi State. With that being said, if you could have played quarterback and continued on the offensive side of the ball, and thank goodness you're on the defensive side of the ball because you were a joy to watch, who would you have liked to play for? Who would have been the fifth you'd like to play for? That like, look, like? All right, I'll just put this on out here right now. First of all, I want to play defense because I don't like getting hit. I'll just throw that out there right now. <laughs> uh, I took a couple of hits, and they're never fun. Now, that all being said, I, I do think, if I could pick any offensive system, I would have loved to have been in more of a, a spread type offense. But yeah. um, just because when I was running, I mean, we had two wide receivers, but we were more uh, option based. And, you know, I and I tell this to everybody said, look, I was a quarterback because I threw for more yards than I ran for. So I threw for like twelve hundred. I ran for like eight hundred. So for me, that means I play quarterback. Um I would have loved to have been more of a, a shotgun or a spread with some of the options still mixed in there. So I had some RPO or some run pass action where I could still use my legs and be that type of defense, uh, uh, that type of guy. But I'm all, you know, I would have loved to play for a, uh, a quarterback, for, well, not really a quarterback friendly guy, but quarterback friendly system. But Gus Malzon would have been a really good coach for me because he has all this spread, but you are definitely the quarterback run is definitely a live type thing. I could pull it, get on the edge, next you know, throw it out wide to one of my wide receivers. Uh, all those other things. For me, I would have loved to play for the Gus Bus, even though I know Auburn fans hate on the Gus Bus. As me as a quarterback coming to high school, I would have loved to play for Gus Malzahn. Wow. Wow, I did not expect that answer. I'm, I'm actually kind of impressed. Hey, something <laughs> I always ask former athletes to come on the show. Talk about your recruitment. Uh, when it came down to it, who were you deciding between? And what was the craziest personal recruiting story that you've got? So, you know, recruiting was totally way so different than what it is now. Um, um, for me, I didn't get to go on a whole bunch of different places. And early on in my recruiting uh, stop, I started having other. So Alabama was the first team to offer me. Then after that, Auburn came like a week or so later. Then everybody else started calling and things. And my brother just signed with Troy State the year before. It was now Troy University. And my mom asked me to stay within the state. She had every school in the whole state is offered you, you know, just stay within the state so we can go to – it'll be easier for as your parents to go to both games or travel to everywhere. And it won't right. be such a, a, a burden on us because my parents always went to games. Like, they didn't miss any of our football games. Whether one of us one, – one parent would go the other way all the time. That was – Nothing unusual for our, for our for my parents. So um, I agreed to do that. I told Coach Bill Clark to I'm going to stay within the state. And I'll just pick a school here. I had every school to choose from. So that's what I did. And it came down to it at the end of the day between Auburn and Alabama. And I chose Alabama for three reasons. And it's because, number one, my, the colors of Alabama were closer to what my high school colors were. So I knew I looked good in it versus like blue and orange. I didn't right. know how that was going to look on me. Like, I just didn't know. Um, but that's the mind of an 18-year-old. So that's the first right. reason was the colors were similar. So I was cool with that. Then number two, Alabama was Nike. Auburn was Russell Athletic at the time. And I was like, dude, I'm upgrading from that. Like, I had that in high school. So <laughs> I wanted to upgrade to Nike. That was the thing. And then my DB coach, Chris Thurman. I liked him better than the Auburn defensive back coach at the time. Uh, but I love Tommy Tuberville, though, at the time. I got to, you know, I'm still up and down about him now. I, I don't love him as a senator as much as I liked him as a head coach, head football coach. <laughs> you know my two rules. We're not talking about politics or COVID on my show here. <laughs> I, I'm with you. I'm with you. But I saw some of his commercials. I'm just like, dude, I want you to talk about something at least. Like, just talk. Give me something for the state you're serving. Thank you. You know, there's a fun story about Tommy Tuberville here in Mississippi. 
Uh, my sister went to Ole Miss. Uh, uh-huh. I went to state. You know, but uh, my best friend from high school went to Ole Miss. Uh, uh, it, my best friend from college it now lives in Oxford. So, I mean, I have a lot of ties to Oxford, but uh, half my family's Ole Miss, the other half state. But Tommy Tuberville came out before the Egg Bowl that year and saying, I'm not going anywhere. I have no interest in the Auburn job. The only way I'm leaving Oxford is in a pine box. And about 11 to 14 hours later, it was announced he's the head coach at Auburn. (laughs) And and I remember people then, then saying, this guy's got a future in politics. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, say whatever he needs to say, right? It's like, dude, we're not going to talk about politics, but you're right. We're not going to talk about it, but you're right. Oh, let's talk about your NFL day. Actually, I'm going to tie the same question to the, to the um, here on both from college and uh, pro. What was your welcome to the SEC moment, and what was your welcome to the NFL moment? Uh, I think my welcome to the SEC moment was just – I mean, when I got there – my freshman year, I was small. I, I was just like, wow, everybody's so much bigger. Um, it was a real realization that I had some growth to do and I needed to do some things. But I I, I had, I do say it was this one play in practice where I'm like, I know I can play, though. It's just, you know, I, it was this senior running back that was always running hard. And it's not this, he was a walk on running back. And he was a, he was a, not that big, but he was very strong. And, um, you know, when I say not that big, I mean not that tall. He was still like 200 pounds. But and I was just always like, man, you know, you know what? I'm tired of this. You know what I'm going to do next time? And I wasn't a big hitter in high school. I never hit anybody. I just intercepted the ball and made a couple tackles here and there. And um, but I said, you know what? I'm going to like not I'm, I'm going to just try and not slow down. And when I hit this guy, I'm just going to try and run right through him. I'd never done that before. and. Um, and I thought it was going to hurt. And then I caught him in the hole one time. He had the ball, and I didn't break stride, and I blew him up. And um, and it didn't hurt. And from there, it was like a switch in my head happened, like, oh, like it doesn't hurt. Like, mm-hmm. I can do this. And from there, you just start building. And you just start grinding. And you're just getting a little bit better. Continue to work on your craft. Uh, I played a lot of dime and some nickel situations early in my career before I was a full-time starter at safety and just – Man, I just loved contact. I loved flying around. I loved playing fast. And um, the better I got at it, the the more slack the coaches gave me. They allowed me to do freedom, have some freedom in which I did some things and some other and, and the way I which I played. So um, I, I really appreciated the coaches trusting me as well. And I'm a very instinctual player, so I really just I, I leaned on that a lot. And from there, I just I just went. And that kind of just led me to to the success that I had. I got you. What was your welcome to the NFL moment? Uh, it was, you know, my first play I ever made in the NFL. I made it against Drew Brees. I knocked the pass down. I felt I felt that was so cool. And then, but the real welcome moment was when I saw Joe Horn in the locker room, and it was like, dude, that's Joe Horn. And then, <laughs> like Reggie Bush was my roommate, but he was a rookie, so it wasn't. It was like it was just Reggie. It was cool, but it was like. Man, I'm really in the NFL. And um, and when Joe Horn would, like, bet crazy amounts of money on, like, throwing, like, paper balls into a trash can, it was like he bet on everything. It was just like, this is what wow. it is, is that the NFL is nothing but college, but guys are older with a lot more money. That's really all it is. It's like the same dumb stuff that we did in college, but now it's just bigger toys, older guys. And, um, and when I played Michael Vick, I was starstruck. The first time that was like the welcome back to the Superdome, the Saints versus Falcons, my rookie year, 2006. We beat the brakes off of them. But for me, I, I mean, everybody was all excited to be back in the Superdome. I had never been there. I didn't understand why everybody was all crying and stuff. I didn't really get it. Um, for me, I was like, dude, that's Michael Vick. And that's way cooler than playing in this Superdome thing. Wow. That is I would be in awe if I'm on the field with with Michael Vick. I would, you know. <laughs> It, was there like a freak out moment? Like, man, I hope he doesn't chill me up and posterize me here. Man, he shook me really bad one time. And I don't even think he was trying to shake me, but he was so fast. He's the fastest person I've ever seen with the ball in their hand. Like, I've seen guys run fast without the ball. But when you have the ball, it's right. like different. And he was so fast. He made another guy miss, but he shook me and I like fail. 
when he was shaking another guy like 10 yards away, it was like that fast. It was, you won't see it on TV. It was like not, nobody will ever know what happened, but I know. And I guess I'm telling everybody else now, but it did happen. And that was like, wow, that was like crazy. But the NFL teaches you so many unique little things, man. You got to be perfect when your technique comes, false steps, all that stuff gets you beat. Those are the things you just learn um, in while you're playing. And the, the thing I, that I really, really tried to hang my hat on was that I was not a repeat offender. And I mean that by saying I didn't mess up on the same stuff over and over again. And if you do that, coaches always try and find a way to say, OK, well, he's still improving. He's still finding ways he can. You know, we can still work with that. And I think that is what allowed me to stick around for as long as I did. Hey, Roman, hold that thought because we got to take a short break here on Tide 100.9. And when we come back, we are going to continue our interview with Alabama player Roman Harper. Welcome back inside the Stingray Show, everybody, right here on Tide 100.9, and we are going to continue the interview with Roman Harper. And Roman, let's go on ahead and talk about your playing days at the University of Alabama right here on the capstone. And early on in your career, you guys welcomed in number one Oklahoma the year after they won the national title. Talk about that game in Bryant-Denny Stadium under the line because that game was action-packed and I was actually a fan there in the stadium watching that game. Talk about your experience in that game, please. Man, that was the one when Brody, like, fumbled the ball backwards. That was Franchoni. Yeah. That was the next year was at, okay. at Alabama where we lost and we played them pretty well, right? It was just weird. Look, we, we had no offense. I look at Alabama, score 30, 40 points, and I'm like, dude, if we ever had 35 points, Man, could you imagine what it would have been like? Yes. Um, it, it's um, but we had we had lacked so many different things um, as a team when it comes to not having a training camp. I look back now, I'm like, there's no way in the world we were supposed to even be good. But um, we battled it out, we grinded. We were very young on defense. Uh, it was a great atmosphere, though. That was the first game that I felt like I played in that was really big time atmosphere at Bryant Denny Stadium that I actually. <laughs> had a part in doing um, that I was actually playing a large amount of snaps. So yes. it was really fun uh, looking back on it. I did have one big hit that game and make it so bad. The guy that I hit I actually became really good friend. I, I became friends with one of his best friends, uh, Jamal Brown uh, from offense alignment in new Orleans. And it's crazy like how small the world is yes. uh, when all that stuff happens and we all look up and we're all in locker rooms and we joke about certain things and come to find out, that was me that hit his friend, and um, and he remembered that play. So it's just funny, small world. Yes. We were not good enough to win those games. When right. when it come, when you play against teams that are better than you, you have to be able to execute at the moment when it counts the most. And we did not do that. We punted the ball way too many times. We couldn't do anything offensively when we needed to. You got a bit of a throw and complete passes consistently, and we didn't do that. Uh, we didn't do that enough. And I remember, because I was actually at that game, uh, Alabama had the lead, and they stopped Oklahoma. And Bob Stoops went for a the fake, fake, punt. Punt, fake punt. Were you on the field when that happened? No, I was not. Okay. I would have stopped it. I would have stopped it myself. <laughs> Man, not. how frustrating was that for you guys on the sideline, though? It's got to be frustrating. But the thing is, I played so much ball since then, I don't even hold emotions towards right. anything that happened in college. It's like I, I do good if I remember it. And the only reason I really remember some of these things is because I've watched the games since. Yes. Um, so now I pick up a little bit of feeling of the ebbs and flows of the game. And that's why I can sit up here candidly and say, like, we just did not deserve to win a lot of those games that we lost. And there's no reason um, – there's no reason other than that. Um, the, the best teams win. The best teams make things happen during yes. the game, whether it's adjustments, 
whether you got to do whatever you got to do to to win the game. That's why you call a fake punt. That's why there's no reason for when I and when I looked at that fake punt, why were we not in like a punt safe or like a regular we had like a regular return and it's like fourth yes. and whatever. It was not smart, especially where they were at in the field goal. It went like they were way backed up. It was it was like close to the midfield where you should be thinking alert fake punt. It's little stuff like that that I've learned as I've gotten older and what it takes to win games week in and week out. Right. It's like it's just little things. You just gotta be prepared for those. And uh that's all little small details. Well, a little bit later that season, you guys had a five overtime game with Tennessee. Talk about how exhausting it is to play in a five overtime game. You know, and we didn't even have substitutions. We we didn't we didn't have enough guys back then to like rotate D line and line. We didn't we didn't rotate. We just everybody had to play, right. and um, it is exhausting. But when you're defending from the 25 yard line, man, it's not that bad. You play a lot of plays. You get beat up, but. Look, man, if you think you're sore in college, wait till you – hopefully you're blessed enough to play long enough in the league where you're really sore. I mean, I, I look back. I was talking to somebody just the other day. They were like, man, your body's got to hurt so bad playing football. I'm like, yeah, when you get old. But, you know, when I'm 16, 17, I could play two games in a day and won't feel a thing. I can get up the next day feel great. Same thing in college. You just – you get beat up, but you're not that sore. The biggest wow. thing is you can stay healthy. You don't get sore. You can get injured more than you'll be sore. At least that's my experience from college. And then when I got to the NFL, I started to get a little bit more sore as the hits became bigger, the people that you defended became bigger, and uh, you continue to age because Father Time is still undefeated. Yes. Yeah, Robert, thank you for bringing that up. What age is it that you really start to see that difference? You know, of when your body's starting to hurt in the NFL, like, is it mid-20s, late 20s? What? What for you? What was it? Because I, I've always wondered that with guys, because you know we were all young once, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and now, uh, heaven forbid, if you sleep wrong on your shoulder, it hurts for two or three days now. Uh, <laughs> when you're in your forties, like I am, but <clears throat> you know, what 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 is that age in the NFL where it it really starts nagging you and it it goes longer than a day? What was that for you? So, you know, everybody tries to focus on more nutrition and, and taking care of their bodies now than they did in the past, right? Everybody continues to try and improve on that year after year after year. For me personally, though, when I felt the difference when it comes to soreness and what I need to do to continue to maintain my body at the highest level, it's it was like later 20s. So like 27, 28, 29, that's when I was really like, man, I got to, I'm, I'm like sore. like, And it takes me, I'm not just feeling better on like Tuesday. Like, I'm like, right. all right, Monday, I'm usually, I used to be fine on Monday. Like, by Monday night, I was feeling okay. And Tuesday, I was fine. But now, you know, you if you're lucky enough and blessed enough to play as long as I did, I mean, by the time I left and I was 33, 34, it was, by the time I hit, you know, Wednesday, I was just now starting really to recover pretty good from Sunday's game. And, uh, you know, Monday, I'm just completely shot. Tuesday, I'm still sore, but I'm trying to work out to work some of the soreness out. Then Wednesday, I move around, but I'm still kind of sluggish. Thursday, I'm ready to go. So it's just it just takes time. But also, you have to get in the rhythm, understanding your body, what it takes to get back right. Because all you're doing is tearing your body down on a Sunday to, like, you, you know, you, to tear it down on Sunday to try and build it back up Monday through Saturday just to tear it down again on Sunday. So mm -hmm. you just got to get in that rhythm and understand your, your routine and what you need to do to get right mentally and physically to get ready to go win a game. You were a quarterback. We already talked about that. Correct. In your opinion, who's the greatest quarterback of all time? Tom Brady. Everyone the, keeps saying that on the show. We ask all the quarterbacks that question. Well, the, the discussion's over. When he won this last Super Bowl, the discussion is over. I mean, before that, I could listen to some other guys, like Joe Montana. That was the only other one I would even consider. Um, you know, I would – those are the only two I would take. Um, and – but, no, the discussion's over now. It's Tom Brady. No, There's no, there's no question. You know, it, it, is it fair to say that he's not the greatest – uh, uh, all the times when the time counts, he is the greatest. Is that a fair assessment of Tom Brady? No, no. I'll take Tom <laughs> Brady all the time. I'll take Tom Brady all the time. I, I'll take Tom because he doesn't have to throw the ball to win games. 
he does whatever it takes to win a game. And not only that, but just look at his leadership. I mean, right. look how much more confident Tampa Bay is as an organization, as yeah. a team, as an offense, and as a defense when they have Tom Brady taking snaps. It just permeates through the locker room. It's just something about it. It's the GOAT effect. And he has it, and it spreads. And it's just one of those things. You can't really put a finger on it. You don't know why the defense is all of a sudden way better. And, yes, it does have to do with personnel. And, yes, it does have to do with the coordinator getting better and understanding that they got some young guys. But, hey, when your quarterback's going to do whatever it takes to take care of the football and he's going to do play at the highest level all the time and he's going to drive everybody else to get better around him, like it just raises the game of everybody. And he's one of those guys that does that. And when it counts the most, he nobody's outperformed him when it matters the most. Nobody. I asked you that to ask you this. Uh, we followed the age question, and I went to the quarterback question. Tom Brady says he wants to play to like forty-eight or whatever. I it mean, was how, forty-four. How how is he doing this now? I'm in my forties, and I'm like, good lord, I I'm out of breath when I tie my shoes. Well, I saw him on Instagram the other day. I mean, he has looking like he's aged, so he's aging. That's for sure. But if he wants to do it, man, if he still can stay healthy, they don't hit the quarterback. They don't hit the quarterback anymore either. So that helps. And um, Tom knows how to get rid of the ball. And your linemen are going to block their, their butts off just to make sure that they're not the one that gives up the sack that ends Tom Brady's career. So oh, wow. everybody's going to do it. Everybody works harder. But I, who's to tell uh, – who's going to – you're going to see – you're going to be the guy – Mr. Heath, to tell Tom Brady he needs to retire? Oh, gosh, I don't no. think I would be that guy. No. And if no. Tom Brady called me right now and said, Roman, I need you this year, I'm like, dude, I'm coming. Because that would be the only way I would get another ring is if I went out there for Tom Brady. Roman, you brought up a great point. I didn't think we were going to go down this road. Uh, I'm a big baseball guy. I always have been. Played a little bit past high school. You know, but I remember when guys, and it's, it's always in any sport, people are like, oh, they need to retire. They need to retire. You know, and I used to get so mad about that. I was like, it's his life. It's his career. Mm -hmm. If he can do it until he's 50, let him do it until he's 50. You know, mm -hmm. a, a great example for baseball was Ricky Henderson. After his, you know, career in Major League Baseball, he still wanted to play. And he was playing independent league. He was playing some minor league ball because Ricky loved the game. And people are like, oh, well, he's hurting his Hall of Fame chance. It's like, no, he's not hurting anything. The man wants to play. Let him go out on his own terms. Yep. You know, a lot of people don't get to pick their own terms. I agree. I agree. Hardly any of us do. But with that being said, I'm with you, Roman, on that. Is that, you know, if a guy wants to play till he's 40-whatever, let him play to 40-whatever. You know, I, I get so tired of people talking about, oh, Tom won this when he should walk away. He, he can walk out on top. Let Tom do what he wants to do. Let Peyton do what he wanted to do. You know, just mm -hmm. let these guys live their life and have their career. You don't have a say so. No, look, for those that are lucky enough to get to decide when they get to walk away or when they want to walk away, it's it's different. Uh, Peyton had kind of had some injuries, and he, right. it was time. Um, and he was just fortunate enough to win that last Super Bowl before he got out of there. And with Tom, I mean, Tom told you, at, like, he's holding the champ, the Super Bowl trophy. Last year, and he's like, we ain't, I'm going, I'm, we coming back. We're repeating next year. It's like, I ain't going nowhere. Don't even ask me the question. It's not even a and then they re-signed all 22 starters i'm like this all they did was reload how did right. they even all of a sudden do all this well tom brady that's exactly how so it, everybody is better with tom I, I don't care you know bill belichick's a great coach but man you show me a great coach i bet he's got I, he can probably show you some really good players on that roster too that's just <laughs> what it is it is a player driven league when you got good players you're going to have a good coach I don't care what you say. Good coaches, you know, they put their players, their best players in position to make plays. But if, if I, I don't care. There is no good coach without good players. Yeah, speaking of, uh, uh, um, you know, great coaches, and I've asked this question to several of the former football players that have come on our show. If you're 17, 18 years old, and you're getting ready to do it all over again, what coach would you love to play for? In college, um, I, you know, I, I don't know them all the same like that personally. I, right. I would, you know, look, if, if you just want to go to the league and you want to be competitive and win championships, yes, you go to Alabama. But it, it's other options out there now. 
you you can go to any school and get to the NFL now. It's not like it used to be where if you want to be seen, you want to be on these the big stages. It's not about that. Some people have really big dreams. Like my boy Charles Peanut Tillman, he said he chose uh, 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 Louisiana, uh, University of Louisiana, uh, uh, the Raging Cajuns, because yeah. he knew he could go in there and play. It's like I wanted to play three or four years, and I wanted to try and go to the NFL. So I knew it was a team that was in the middle of the way, but I could play. And that's all he cared about. So I went to a place that could play early, and then I wanted to go. And he did. So if you have a goal in mind, and it has nothing to do so much about, you know, um, you know, it does have a lot to do with it. But at the same time, if you have the right mindset, you can achieve so many great things. And it's not so much as always, you know, the coach is the one that makes the player or the coach is the one that gets the player drafted. No, it's really the player that's been focused and has worked and put in the time and has the unique ability and the talent to do something great. And all those things come to fruition at the right time with the body maturity, staying out of trouble. And then next, you know, he gets his name called on that Thursday, Friday or Saturday for the NFL draft. Well, uh, let's go back to your playing days at uh, Alabama. Here is a fun question. Can you tell us a fun story that happened between you and your defensive coordinator, Joe Kynes. <laughs> I love uh, Joe Kynes. Yeah, man. So, so I, all right, here's one that nobody probably knows this. So, I, first of all, I love Coach Kynes. I saw him on a, uh, right before uh, COVID shut down everything, uh, we went on this Alabama boat cruise or whatever, and he was there. Man, I talked to him and his wife for like a whole day. I, I just love Coach Kynes, man. And, He's just so proud of me and just, you know, growing up and it's just crazy. Uh, you just never know what life is, where life is going to take you on that journey sometimes and who he puts, who God puts in your life for the right reasons. Yeah. All right. So saying all that, but so I was in, I was in college and, you know, we had curfew on Thursdays and I was one of those guys that always hung out. I was just, that's who I was in college. So I went out cause they had this, I think it was like 17th floor and uh, they were playing at the I remember 17th floor. floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, my time. I remember yeah. 17th floor. Yeah, there we go. I mean, they, they, the cover band that played everything. So, yeah. So, yeah, so 17th floor came in and it was like, it was always rocking. So I went out and, you know, I got, I guess I got caught out, but nobody really, it was just one of those things. And, um, and Coach Kynes like called me in the next day and he's like, look, we're going to have to punish you. You're going to have to run or something. He, he's like, but I ain't suspended you. He's like, you know, other people are talking about, we're going to suspend him, sit him out. Of, for like a half or a quarter. He's like, he's like, I don't punish the rest of the team for one person. Like, no, nah, we ain't doing that. You going to play, but we'll, we're, we're worried about the other stuff next week. All right. But just know you got to stay in sometimes. Okay. I'm like, all right, coach, I got you, man. Appreciate it. So he looked after me, but he always taught me the right things. And he still taught me the, per the, the saying of the most perfect fit. And I've never heard anybody else say it or use it, but he would be like, you know, whenever we'd be practicing our defensive schemes and he'd be like, oh, when we stopped the run play and it was like a perfect fit. So we had somebody inside the block, outside the block and a free hitter. It's like a perfect fit. So everybody all falls in place. It's like a Legos. It all goes together. And he's like, it's like a perfect fit. It's like your, own, your finger and your nose. He's like, there is no better perfect fit than your own finger and your own nose. And I was like, I never thought about that. But I'm like, you know, that's really true, actually, coach. I never thought about that. But. There is no better fit than your own finger and your own nose. That's true. <laughs> Thank you for that visual, Roman. <laughs> Gross. Well, on that note, we got to take another break right here on Tide 100.9. And when we come back, we are going to talk with Roman Harper about the famous play he made against Tennessee that ultimately won them the game here in Tuscaloosa. That and a whole lot more coming up on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show right here on Tide 100.9. And we 
are back here on Tide 100.9, and let's go on ahead and finish up the interview with Roman Harper. So, Roman, let's go on ahead and talk about the play that all the Alabama fans want to hear, the forced fumble versus Tennessee in 2005. Please walk us through that play. Well, so it was a screenplay to a fullback. Great play, great call. They ran it earlier and had some success. And we were in a cover three, it looks like, from what I remember or what I've seen on the tape. And um, I was a middle of field safety. And I'm just going to be honest. I mean, it it was it parted open pretty wide open. And I thought he ran me over because I heard the, the crowd go. I just saw him. I just ran over there, just tried to meet him before the, that got to the end zone. And I just threw my body at him. I shot at him. I, you know, there was – he was way bigger than me, and I was going to try and hit him on about the four or the five yard line. So I actually thought he ran me over because that was Tennessee side. So all the Tennessee fans are right there in that end zone, right over there in that corner. So when I heard the loud roar, I thought he scored. I thought he had ran me over because uh, I didn't like wrap him up or really bring him down. I didn't feel him like fall down over me. So I didn't know what had happened. Uh, I just threw my body, and then I heard this loud roar. And then I, I kind of stood up, and then I saw my teammates celebrating and running off. So I started celebrating and running off, and I was like, well, what happened? And then I'll never forget. I, I never forget. I was literally on the bench, and I get over to the sideline, like, and everybody over there celebrating, like, man, he fumbled the ball. He fumbled the ball. And I was like – and I turned to Aunt Madison, Anthony Madison, like, dude, who, who, who knocked the ball out? He's like, I don't know who knocked it off, but it was a great play. And then we looked up on the Jumbotron, and lo and behold, it was me. It was like I hit him, and the ball just flew out. It's, the ball's not supposed to go that way when you hit somebody in that direction. It's supposed to go the other way, but it just went. I don't have no idea. Just, I, that's why I'm, I guess I'm just supposed to be where I'm at, and that's the play that's supposed to like make me uh, like forever remembered in Alabama history because that is it. And when it happened – I'll never forget, I was sitting there with Anthony Madison. We were looking, we saw him, he's like, he said, dude, that was you. And I was just in shock. Like, I can't believe he fumbled that ball. And he's like, dude, that's going to be a Daniel Moore painting. He said, that's like a Daniel Moore moment. And then next thing you know, a couple months later, I had that too. So it's just really weird how it all worked out. But And I'm glad Brody made the throw to DJ Hall because if it would have been off or not, we didn't actually win the game. So it just kind of all wrapped it up. But we won the game 6-3, to three, just wow. Um, but, yeah, it was, that's what happened. I thought he ran me over. And, Roman, if you go back and watch, that ball could have gone out at any time, but it <laughs> rolled right down the edge and into the back of the end zone. I was like, holy cow. <laughs> well, it probably shocked so many people while you're watching it live because that's just not what you thought was going to happen. Right. And, you know, you know, football is an oblong object. It's an oblong ball that bounces every which way. There, it does not just roll forward or backwards. It goes every which way. So, it look, man, it, it was – I'd rather – sometimes you'd rather be lucky than great. And uh, that was one of those moments. It's funny, though, because um, one of my teammates from the Super Bowl in New Orleans, his name was Marvin Mitchell. He played linebacker. That was his freshman year. And he was teammates with that fullback. Uh, Corey Anderson was his name. And he said – and. When he realized that that was me that hit Corey Anderson in that game, he's like, oh, my God, that was you? I'm like, yeah, bro. He's like, oh, my – oh. He, like, lost. He said, dude, you ruined that guy's career. He never touched the ball again after that. They, like, lost faith in him. It was messed up. I mean, I felt bad, but not really. It was just like, well, it's just one of those things. I mean, right. it, it was, like, great for me. Uh, it was suck for him, but it was great for me. Well, uh, a follow-up to that – what was the locker room and the game uh, after uh, like? Because that was the first time Alabama had beaten Tennessee <laughs> in quite a while. Uh, so the locker room was nothing that I remember special. It was just great. Um, we were just really happy. Um, Mike Shula was not into smoking cigars, so I'm kind of mad we didn't get to smoke cigars like we did in the past. Oh, no, no, no. I know, I know, I know. It's all right. No. Shula is very straight-laced. That's what he wanted. It is what it is. But going out that night to the bar afterwards, it was like it, like when I walked into the bar, it was me, 
two of my brothers and one of my homeboys. It was like the Red Sea party when I went in. It was great. I didn't buy any drinks. It was awesome. But I got an even better story. Not even that night. That night was great. It was cool. But I had an English class that I took once a week, and I had it on Monday so I could miss practice. Um, so I would do it on Mondays. I, that's I had it scheduled that way. So, and I didn't go to I didn't go to class the Monday before the Tennessee game, and then I missed again. I don't know what I was doing, playing around, messing around, just being dumb. And I didn't go the week after the. Or I didn't go after the Tennessee game either. And then the following week, I played another game, and then I showed up, but I was late. So I hadn't been in, like, almost three weeks. And uh, it's just a once-a-week class. And I was, I'm was i walking in, I'm like, dude, I have to have some kind of excuse. I have to have something in my mind. I don't know what I'm going to tell her because I know they see me playing football, but I don't know. So I walk in, and as soon as I walked in, they gave me a standing ovation. The whole class stood up and just gave me a standing ovation for like two minutes. And I was just like, I was shocked. I was like, uh. And then like, before I could say anything, I was like, she was like, I was like, uh, I said, uh, and, and I just was quiet. And she was like, I mean, we've been waiting on you for a couple of weeks now. Every time the door opens, we waiting on thinking it's you. We're just all ready to celebrate and just be so happy for you. And I was like, uh, my bad, I've been kind of like not feeling it. It's like, oh, that's all good. Just go sit down. So I just went and sat down. It was, it was great. So that tells you I missed class for three weeks and I got a stand ovation when I came back. That was my best Alabama moment right there. That's when I was like, dude, playing football here is just different. Yes. <laughs> Roman, I want to ask you this. You could talk trash about it, but it's actually a serious question. All right. You know, I, I'm, I'm 45. Mm -hmm. I know all that. I grew up, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. I, I live right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. I work in Shelby County, which is Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, there's a ton of Tennessee fans in this area. There's a lot of Alabama fans. And the third Saturday in October, it used, used to be. Yeah, it used to be. So special. Like, you cleared your calendar. And even, even as a Mississippi State fan, you know, in, in grad, you know, I always knew when that game was and what time it was coming on, and, and I'm I'm going to make sure I'm watching that game. It's not even a game anymore. It's not even a rivalry anymore. And, and, and I guess this is about the only negative thing you could say about Nick Saban is that he's destroyed that rivalry because he's owned it. He's <laughs> well, just owned it. But, not only has he destroyed that rivalry, he's got a lot of coaches in the SEC fire too. It's He has yeah. changed the standard. He is the standard. The, he is the standard. Yes. And he has gotten a lot of people unsatisfied. He's changed all rules because he's winning like nobody's ever seen done before in the SEC at that type of consistency for 10 years running, 12 years now. He's just – he is the standard. And for everybody on the other side of it at Auburn that wanted to hate on Gus Malzahn, Gus Malzahn was the only one that had created a standard at beating Alabama. So yeah. he was the only one that actually were able to beat Alabama as well. So it's been real interesting to see that. And you're right. There is no – Tennessee can't even talk. They they, they don't yeah. – and until they find the right quarterback or the system to go, I think Hype will at least have them competitive offensively. But they got a lot of holes to replace. They have a lot of turmoil and so many things on the outside factors right now that's kind of pulling at that program. But Hypo should be a calming factor. He will get them going offensively. You know that. But, yeah. they, you know, last year the Alabama game was not – it wasn't a blowout until second half. And then next you know, Tennessee did what Tennessee did and just totally shot themselves a foot. And next you know, the game gets out of control. And Tennessee had to keep it close because they didn't have the quarterback play last year consistency-wise to go out there and win your game throwing the football. And not only that, but when you watch the offense break down, the – the concepts are nothing to even bat an eye at. The concepts are so easy. It's no, it's like, you know, late 90s, early 2000s concepts of football. They're not doing anything special. And sometimes when you're lackluster in some areas, you got to do things to make that area up. You can't be just always defensive minded and think you're going to just scheme these things up. You know, if I played quarterback and I hadn't played quarterback in a long time, I'm coming out there and telling my coach, coach, let me go play action, throw the ball deep, first play. Let me back these people up. You got to do something instead of just turning around and handing the ball off and thinking you got this big offensive line and you just want to push people around. And that's mm -hmm. what Tennessee prided themselves on last year. But all of a sudden, ever since that second half of Georgia, 
when Georgia punched them right back, they folded and they were never the same the rest of the year. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to follow up with what you said, and I think we'll agree on this. Roman, I didn't know we would agree on almost everything <laughs> we have so far on the show. <laughs> but, Great minds. But, yeah. Is it fair to say that Mark Rick got fired because he's not Nick Saban? Is it fair to say Les Miles got fired because he's not Nick Saban? Yes. I mean, there's some great coaches that have done phenomenal things, and they got fired because of Nick Saban. Yep. And it, it's absolutely terrible that these coaches are judged on what I think is the absolute greatest coach of all time. I think he's better than Bear Bryant. I don't think Bear Bryant could do it in today's world where the even scholarships and everything else – you know, Nick Saban is doing it. And we had Tony Barnhart on the show. And, and I, you can steal this line from Tony. He'll claim it if you do. But Tony said on our show, I asked him, I said, is Nick Saban the greatest of all time? And he said, Nick Saban is the greatest college football coach of all time, but Bear Bryant's the greatest coach that Alabama will ever have. And, and I laughed at that statement. And, and, and Mark Schleyball came on the show. And we told him that story. And Schleyball laughed at that statement. But – Nick Saban has changed not only the game, but I mean, I don't think we'll ever see this again. I have a 10 year old son, loves football. He's a D lineman. He loves defense. And I tell him all the time when we're watching the game, I was like, it's like, you're going to grow old one day and you're going to tell your kids about Nick Saban and how great they were. And I don't know how much longer this is going to last. I don't know how much longer he's going to coach. I know about his contract and all about that. But I tell him all the time, I was like, you need to watch them as much as possible because one day he'll be gone. Yes. Is there anybody that rivals Nick Saban? Because I say no. No, I, I don't think so. And I know everybody wants to be the purest in the old school. But, dude, I, look, Bear Bryant died the year I was born. So uh, Nick Saban's the best college football coach of all time. He's also the best coach in Alabama's history. Uh, he's been able to accomplish what Bear Bryant took 20 years or more to do what he's been able to do in 12 years. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, the numbers that he's being do and to follow up on what you said earlier was, I don't think Nick Saban got Mark Rick fired. I think Mark Rick was just like the relationship got stale. Just yeah. it's like, all right, we've been married 30 years. The kids are growing up, you know, COVID hit. We really at the house a lot. We really don't love each other like that. Why are we going to spend these, these last 25 years together in misery? Let's just cut it off. Let's go live our best, our separate ways. Also, Georgia knew that they had another younger version that they really wanted in Kirby Smart in the wings, ready. They knew that. So that was why they let go of Mark Rick, because they knew Kirby Smart was about that time, that they had another option. Um, Les Miles, that's purely just Nick Saban. They were just mad. They didn't even want to give Les Miles credit when he did win his championship because they said it was with Nick Saban's recruits. Yeah, so I remember. It was, it was, it was never – as much credit as needed, but Les Miles is still LSU's all-time winningest coach, and they fired him. And he won like 60-some yeah. percent of his games, and they fired him. And the only reason LSU's standard of football is where it is right now is because of Nick Saban. And it's not because Nick Saban left LSU to go to Alabama. He left to go to Miami. But LSU had Les Miles at the time when he wanted to come back to college. So it just worked out that way. And let's not forget, Alabama's lucky and wet. They got Nick Saban because – they wanted Rich Rodriguez first, but Rich Rod used that as leverage to get a bigger deal where he was at, and then they had to fall back down and try and get Nick Saban. So things work out for crazy, but Alabama, we should not just beat our chest like we're the greatest thing since sliced bread because we almost messed that up and didn't get the greatest coach. And uh, Nick Saban paid dividends immediately, changed everything. I just love how he runs the program. Uh, I, I love everything about it, how competitive they are. And – like I said before, he literally is the standard when it comes to college football. I got a good friend. He's he's a Georgia grad. He loves Georgia, of course. Of course, all Georgia fans are crazy. We all know this. Yeah. But <laughs> I said it. Um, you know, but I, I keep telling him all the time. He, he keeps talking about, oh, if we win the SEC this year, oh, if we win the national championship this year. I said, look, 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 look. Until you beat Nick Saban three times in a row, this is still Nick Saban's world. And I said, look at Hugh Freeze. He beat him back to back. Look what happened. Les Miles beat him. He's not even coaching anymore. I like people have beaten Nick Saban, but the the end result is still the same. You know, it, just because you get a victory doesn't mean you have dethroned Nick Saban. 
Is it safe to say that you've got to beat Nick Saban three times in a row to take his spot? I, I'm not going to say that because I don't think Nick Saban loses to anybody three times in a row. But <laughs> you don't I, I, ask. <laughs> I, I, I do think when you beat Nick Saban, it's like, okay, he is human. He does bleed, right? It's like, okay, he bleeds. It's one of those type things where um, he's not he's not, he's not, not like of another planet or anything. He can lose. And it just takes the right team at the right time. You know, when Ole Miss beat him a couple years uh, under Hugh Freeze, it was all about the, the tempo and some other things and the right. rules being the way that they were to dictate some other things. But what did Alabama do? They they adjusted. They got faster D linemen. They got more athletic on defense. They did some different things. The rules changed. Not only that, but Alabama just no longer just depends on their defense. They really depend on their offense and scoring points. Their mentality yes. has changed. Nick Saban is the first one to say that, that you can't win games anymore by holding teams to 14, 17 points. The rules just don't allow you to do that. You have to be able to score now to win in college football, and they have gotten with the program. So that is another thing that Nick has always done. He's adjusted. He's changed with the times. He continues to grow. He continues to stay green. He continues to learn. And that is why he's the best to me is because he always adjusts. He's never, he's never been the one that just stayed the same. He's like the crocodile, not the dinosaur. The crocodile made it. The dinosaur, then gone. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, uh, know, uh, I'm sorry, Stephen. Uh, you know, I'll make this very short. Joe Paterno, and no, I'm not going down that road either. You know, but when he was at Penn State all those years, he changed his system, and they took a lot of losses there for about two or three seasons. Took a lot of hard losses. I remember they lost one game six to four. I mean, it was absolutely horrendous. Um, you know, but – Penn State came out on the other side of that with a new offensive philosophy. Uh, you know, defense got kind of got beefed up, and he started winning again. Nick Saban changed his philosophy and didn't lose. Who does that? How does that even happen? You know, he went from game manager, you know, we're going to have a field general at quarterback, we're, we're going to make this happen, to, oh, yeah, to it, throw it just, you know, 50 times a game, let's have fun. I mean, he changed his whole philosophy and didn't break stride and kept winning at a high level. You know, what's the next thing in college football that Nick Saban has to do to stay on top? Because he's clearly on top. Um, I don't have that particular in mind what, what would be the next thing. But I do know that the reason why he was able to adjust and keep winning is because he didn't adjust to just say, okay, we're just going to implement this quote-unquote system. He built everything around his players and then you continue to recruit and grow, get more of the same type of players that are that are going to be able to have success in the system that you're trying to run. So next, thing you know, when you get a Julio Jones that we can show other young wide receivers around the country that we are willing to throw the ball. We are willing to, to showcase young, talented receiver. And that's how you run off four straight. Well, two years of four first round wide receivers. You're able to do that because. Next, you know, guys want to show up and they want to win championships. They want to compete and they want to play in the SEC because that's where the best players are at. So um, you have all those things going for you. And Nick understands that Alabama's at a place now where they kind of recruit themselves. Um, it's not hard. It's not hard. When Alabama comes calling, you're going to answer the phone. Now, it's still your decision to go, but you're going to answer the phone. Yeah. yeah. I remember Coach Chizik said this on SEC Network one night, and I absolutely loved his answer about it. They asked him what was his favorite part when they started football practice, and he said, my favorite part is when we would take the two and three stars that we signed, and it was their first practice out there, and they would go up against the four and five stars. And he goes, and they would perform, and they could not wait to get back in the locker room and call mom and dad like, I got it. I got it, mom. I got it, dad. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay here. You know, I absolutely love Chiz talking about that and, and the recruiting and the stars and all that kind of craziness. It kind of throw out the door once you put the pads on and start practice. You know, with that being said, Roman, you know, what is the biggest difference, in your opinion, between a two- and three-star and a four- and five-star guy? Because I always think that the two- and three-star guy hasn't fully developed yet, and the four- and five-star guy has developed, and he's not going to improve much more. Yeah, I, I, I was – you hit it dead on. It's more just about size that they are usually typically um, the size of what they look for and the NFL type of body. 
where me, I was like a two star or three star. And that's because I was like six foot, uh, like 170 something, where if I'm like six foot 190, they probably bump you up a star just because like, oh, well, he's got more size. He's got this. And he just looks like he's more ready to play, they would assume. But those things don't matter. It's all about what you do when you get there. And, and it's all about what you put into it. Yes, talent helps. Yes, size helps. Strength helps. All those things. But those are also things that can be developed. It also helps to see what your parents look like. Okay, you see his dad? All right. He can definitely grow. He just needs to get in the weight room. You Just get him in the meal plan. All those other things. So what is your vision for that player as well? That's one thing I learned from Sean Payton in New Orleans was, you know, you got to have a vision for every player that you bring into your locker room or your, that player is not going to pan out to be what you think he can be or what you anticipated him being. You know, Roman, I just thought about this. I probably interviewed you at SEC Media Days back in the day. <laughs> you, you probably did. I was there. So <laughs> Yeah, because I was, I was with CSS, the, the original SEC network, way back in the day. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, we used to do a, a football show. We used to come on. Come in nine states, 11 million homes, talking SEC football. And, uh, yeah, that's I, – I, I put that together earlier in the show. I was like, you know what, I bet you I've interviewed Roman more than once uh, during my time. But uh, that's that's crazy to think about. Uh, why why we got to get old, Roman? I mean, you know, we, we you know the thing is, like, you don't really realize how, that you're getting older when you look at you and your friends. It's when you see you and your friends' kids. That's when you're like, dude, <laughs> we're getting old. Because I feel like I still look the same a little bit. But then you see your kids like getting big. You're like, dude, we're getting old. Right. See, see, see my wife's eight years younger than me, and, and so I'll, I'll bust out a seventeenth floor song every now and again. You know, like uh, pimps, players, hustlers, and hoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the story goes, and she's like, "What are you talking about?" I'm like seventeenth floor. And she had no idea who seventeenth floor was. So it's a great band. I don't awesome. either. Just saying, yeah. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Roman. With that being said. Hey, thank you so incredibly much for joining us. Uh, we'd love to have you back. And, and, and as the season gets closer, we're going to be talking more about football. Uh, it won't be as, as many stories, but I got a feeling we'll, we'll get a story or, or two in. And you know what? I'm going to try to go through some of my old tapes and see if I can find a younger version of me and you at Media Days. I can't wait. Bring it up. I'd love to see it. Send it over to me. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having hey, me, man. It was awesome. Roman, real uh, quick. This is a breeze. This is a breeze. I really appreciate it. Very easy going. You guys are awesome. Great questions. Uh, very easy conversation. I, I thank you for that. Thank oh, you. And Roman, real quick, before we let you go, uh, is there anything that you would like to plug, give a shout out to, or tell people how they can follow you on social media? Yeah, man, you can follow me on social media. Uh, on Instagram, I'm heart41. Uh, okay. No, heart underscore 41. And then on Twitter, I'm heart41. Uh, also, I, I got a podcast, me and my boy Kyle Bailey. It's no, simply you know, subscribe, click, share with your friends. It's literally Kyle Bailey and Roman Harper podcast. It's very simple. Good deal. Man, Thanks. we will subscribe to it. We will help you out any way we can. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the SEC Network. Thank you, guys, man. I appreciate it. Since right. I'm on this show, I can't do it on TV. I can say this, but roll tide. Yes. Hey, Thank Roman, you. real quick before you get out, we got Dari coming on. Any, anything we should ask Dari to put him on the spot and catch him off guard? Uh. No, not really. I mean, Dari's too good, bro. Just know <laughs> he's so good. He's way too good. Just just know he always tries to hit me some quick stuff on live TV. And, like, he's so quick-witted, and he jokes. But, like, you can't you, – you have to midstream adjust because you're on live TV. So you can't just, like, freeze up and be like, oh, Dari, why would you say that? You have to just go with it. And to me, that's the best part about TV with Dari. Yes. Well, man, well, man, hopefully we have not taken up too much of your time and have a great rest of your evening. Hey, thank you guys, man. Good night, man. You guys right. have a great one. You too. Well, man, that was a wonderful interview there with Roman Harper, and we really do appreciate him coming on. As I see, we have gone almost an hour and a half, so hopefully we did not take up too much of his evening. You know, Roman, uh, great player, even better guy. You know, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed his stories. And uh, I did not know that Roman and I would agree almost on everything. I was kind of I was kind of crazy. I was like, wow, we even like some of the same college bands. 
There's your resume tape for the SEC network. <laughs> right over there. Well, they don't need me. They already got Roman. I just need the same guy talking about the same exact thing. And Roman's got the more, you know, football credentials. You know, I got I got you, Stephen. I mean, you know, Saints played in the SEC, Alabama alum, Ethan State. You know what? You're right. I should apply. I'm going to take his job. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, that – that was amazing. And yeah. once again, we really do want to thank Roman Harper, and hopefully he will join us like a lot of other people before we get to the start of the college football season. And on that note, we are going to sign off here on the Stingray Show right here on Tide 100.9. We really hope that you have enjoyed the interview there with Roman Harper and coming up, on Saturday at noon central right here on Tide 100 we are talking with a WWE Hall of Famer and current Fox News business analyst John Bradshaw Layfield about his wrestling days as a wrestling god in the WWE you do not want to miss that awesome interview Saturday right here at noon central on Tide 100.9. We hope that you guys have a great rest of your Thursday evening, great Friday, and we will see you right back here on the Stingray Show for a replay of this show at 11 a.m. Saturday, and then the JBL interview will air at noon central Saturday right here on Tide 100.9. Until Saturday, we will see you guys on down the road.